the process of inheriting a spiritual legacy. Now, we're all inheriting something. God has things for us to inherit. Now, why, are you, why do you inherit anything? And especially a, a legacy, a spiritual legacy, something that's eternal, something that will continue to go on forever. You know, you, you, might, you might leave your children lands or money or businesses or, you know, and that's all good. Tithe. But that's going to end. You know, well, I own this business. Well, it won't be yours one minute after you die. Well, I, I've, 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 you know, I've, I've got a real nice house, and it's paid for. Guess what? It ain't yours any longer the moment you leave. But a spiritual legacy, a spiritual legacy that God wants to pour in you so you can pour into someone else, our children, our grandchildren, and all those adopted children that God brings into our lives. You see, just because they're not blood kin doesn't mean that God didn't bring you into this appointment for a reason. That you can speak into them and you can hear those neighbor kids on your street, on your cul-de-sac, on your block, in your uh, building, you know. I mean, it seems like anymore they're building more townhouses than anything, you know. Just a, a row of six houses, and they're right side of each other, and they're three stories high. And, and, you know, in your little section, there are people that God has appointed for you to pour in a spiritual legacy. Now, the problem is, and God's really rung my bell on this, is the process of receiving the legacy. You see, uh, we do, we're not real good at receiving. Now, case in point, everybody here, I, most everybody here that I know, you, you, if you, a brother and sister in here needed help and it was it, you were able to help, whether it was money or with your skill or with your experience, you would do it. Amen? But how reluctant are you to receive the help? You see, that's where stinking, sorry, hellish pride comes in. That's where your arrogant, oh, it's dressed up in false humility, but it is, it is wretched. Yes, it's more blessed to give and to receive, but we're all to receive because we all have need. None of us go through this life without needing a hand up. Nobody. Now in 2 Kings chapter 2, I got, I'm going to read them all just because I, I got to in order to set the, set the thing, uh, set the, the context. But I believe that God wants us smitten. I believe God wants us undone. I believe God wants us conquered in his love and in his spirit, in his purpose, in his plan. I, when I open my eyes in the morning, I, first thing, I, Lord, help me. To, Lord, it's not wife and kids and job and stuff, but Lord, I want to be smitten. I want to be smitten. I want him I want him to, you see, I'll be a better husband, and I'll be a better father, and I'll be a better grandfather if I'm smitten with him. If I'm undone. If I'm in a place of, of humility. Don't you wish you always got it right? Because none of us do. 
You see, the leaders, and, and you say, well, I'm not a pastor. You're a leader if you're a mom or dad. If you're a grandmother or granddad, you are a leader. If you're an aunt or an uncle, you're a leader. You're a leader. Leaders God will use in the redemption and transformation process. And they go hand in hand. Do you hear me? They go hand in hand. Now, in, in, uh, let me read it to you. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, say tornado, that Elijah went with Elisha to Gilgal. Say Gilgal. That means to spin like a wheel, like a potter's wheel, to spin. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel, which means house of God. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha. Say, preacher boys. And said to him, Hey, Elisha, Elisha, do you know that the Lord is going to take away your master from you today? And he said, yes, I know. Shut up. I mean, keep silent. Same thing. Hush. We'll, we'll clean it up and make it a little bit more delicate and southern. Hush. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me down to Jericho, which means moon. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho, you see, Elijah had a lot of preacher training places. You see, he had a lot of Bible institutes going on. Do you hear what I'm saying? My goodness. Came to Elijah and said, uh, Do you know the Lord will take away your master from, you, uh, from over you today? Uh, from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. You know, he's getting ticked. Yes, I know. Keep silent. You see the exclamation mark? You know, you can put all caps there. He's, he's shouting at him. Then Elijah said to him, uh, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me on to Jordan. Jordan means to descend. To descend. But he said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, bless God and pass the ammunition. I'm not leaving you. So the two went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets, only 50, must have been a large Bible school, went and stood facing them at a distance. They say, Oh, man, something's going to happen. Let's watch this. I want to be an eyewitness. The problem is we got too many people who want to be eyewitnesses and not participators. And he said, and he stood facing at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now they're up to the river. I've been to that river. I've been right there at Jericho. I've been up to the river. And where I come from, in places, we'd call that a creek. Because it's not very wide. But in flood stage, it's a roaring torrent. Do you understand? But needless to say, down at the lower end, close to the Dead Sea, near Jericho, it's deep and it's wider, regardless of the season. And so Elijah took his mantle, you know, he took off his mantle, and he rolls it up. Like I've done all my clothes in that little bitty suitcase I'm taking to Cuba. He rolled it up and he struck the water and it divided this way and that. Say, a mini Red Sea experience. You see what I mean? So, so it rolls up. It, it's, like, it's like jello. You know, just rolls back, backs up. There's the wall. There you go. 
And so it divided, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. He didn't even, he just didn't back up the water. He dried up the mud. Don't tell me my God ain't tough. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elijah, he says, oh boy, I, I've given you plenty of opportunities to stop along the way, and you wouldn't stop. Ask what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you. And Elijah said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, that means there's no place to rest. No, this is not the time to rest, to dawdle, to daydream, or to sleep. This is a time to focus. This is a time to be alert. This is a time to pay attention. It shall, it shall be so for you, and if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened. As they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire. Now, I don't know what kind of flying thing this was. All they knew was horses and chariots. Do you understand? I can only imagine what they would think if they ever saw an F-35. You understand what I'm saying? And separated the two of them. Whoosh, Elijah, Elisha. Keep my eyes open. I'm keeping my eyes on him. You know, this is overwhelming. This is amazing. This is astounding. But he was focused on his goal. He wasn't going, wow, wait, look at that thing, man, wow. He was focused on Elijah. He was focused on his assignment. He was focused. And he said, and, 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 and Elijah went up by a whirlwind. Some people say, oh, a chariot of fire took him up. No, sir. A whirlwind took him up into heaven. And Elijah saw it. And he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. And he saw him no more. And he took off his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He loved Elijah. And Elijah was gone, had his own private rapture. And he loved him. But he realized that his mentor the one pouring spiritual legacy into him. It was time for him to go. And he said, and he took up the mantle of Elijah. Hey, look at here. It fallen from him, and he went back, and he stood by the bank of Jordan. Hmm. Well, I saw him do it. And he took the mantle of Elijah had fallen from him and struck the water. And said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And he crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets, those Jericho boys, uh, who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. I'm telling you, you can tell it when somebody's been with the Lord. And you can tell when the spirit of God is upon them. Do you hear me? What a wonderful testimony to a lost and dying world. And they came to meet him and they bowed to the ground before him. They gave him honor. Honor is a good thing. Honor is the currency of heaven. And he said, they said, look now, there are 50 strong men 
with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, lest perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or in some valley. God might have dropped him. God might have dropped him, you know. I mean, he might not have had a firm grip on him. And he said, you don't need to send anyone, you fool, you dummy. How, 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 how spiritually shallow are you? Now, that's what, I believe that's what he's thinking. And he says, but they urged him till, they, uh, sh till he was ashamed. Boy, that's what religion will do to you. He said, send them. Therefore, they sent 50 men. They searched three days and didn't find him. And they came back to him, for, they, uh, for he had stayed in Jericho. And he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? You know, it was, I, I told you so. Then the men of the city said to Elisha. Now, the men of the city, the leaders of the city, the elders of the city, not the religious crowd, the political crowd. Do you understand? The leaders, the civic leaders. They said to Elijah, please notice the situation of this city. Listen, God's with you, and God can do anything. He said, as my Lord sees, the water's bad and the ground barren. And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. And they brought it to him and... Then he went out to the source of the water, cast the salt in there, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day. I have drank it. According to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. My God. I want you to understand that Elijah created opportunities along the way for Elisha to stop. And leaders, and you're a leader, you must place appropriate value on what is to be inherited. You see, your, your Christian life will really turn, step it up a notch if you realize that what God wants to put in you so you can put it in your children, your grandchildren. In those people that God's brought into your sphere of influence, whether they're blood relation or not, you are to mentor, but he wants to mentor you. You need to be mentored so you can be a mentor, so you can leave a spiritual legacy in the lives of people. That's why we're here, to know him and to pass it on. To know him. You know, it's just like butter on cornbread. He gives you the cornbread and he gives you some butter and pass the butter on. Do you understand? Bless your heart. You see, three times Elijah says, okay, okay, you wait here, I'm going on. You wait here, I'm going on. Elijah must stay close to inherit all Elijah knew he needed. He had to stay close. Much of what you need, now listen to this, is found on the wilderness road. Now, I know there's people say, oh, I don't believe in the wilderness. That's negative. Listen, Jesus got it, was announced and got everything he needed in the wilderness. Do you hear me? Matter of fact, he was down in the wilderness where he got baptized. I've been there. That's no big metropolitan developed area. That's in the wilderness. And we all have a wilderness road to travel. My goodness, if we shun wildernesses, mo a lot of, if, if your people's been here before the 1800s, all of America wouldn't have been settled. They went a wilderness. They had to go through. They cut the road. They found the way. They, made it. they followed the Buffalo Trail. They followed the Indian Trail. They widened the trail so wagons could come. They went in the wilderness. And God has a wilderness road for you and me. And, and don't fret and don't run from it. Embrace it for what it is. For there is legacy to receive along that way. We want it all so, oh, I'm entitled. Everything's good. I want blessings, you know. I can remember growing up in my dad's house, and I, I, it never crossed my mind. Well, when I get out of school, I'm going to buy a house twice as big as dad's. Where did we, where, 
Oh, God help us. God help us. You see, Gilgal was the first opportunity to stop. And it means a wheel rolling you know, like a potter's wheel. Or, or it could be a wheel. They weren't big into wagons then, you understand? Uh, but, but it's a wheel rolling. And this is the picture of the first leg of the wilderness journey. If you want to inherit a historical legacy, the first step is in the process of spinning. Now, the spinning, here's what spinning will do. It'll separate the men from the boys. You see, we'll endure the spitting. The, oh, this is kind of chaotic, and what is going on? And, 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 but as long as I can still see it'll benefit me, I'll hang in there. But if it costs me, I'm getting off. And that's why you see so many casualties in the Christian church. You see, there's spinning that has to go on. You see, it's, it's a, and, and, and the nominal usually quit. As long as they can understand what's happening and they can advance their own agenda, they'll hang in there. Well, I want how I want it, when I want it, where I want it. And why do we think we got so many snowflakes out there melting? You see, when they were over their head, they had to put their trust in him. And God wants to put us on the wheel. And he wants us to spin. You remember in Jeremiah 18, uh, the potter's wheel? You know, the, the Bible says in Jeremiah 18, he puts us on the potter's wheel. And, uh, and he rise, go down to the potter's house, and I'll, I'll call you to hear my word. The spinning, the spinning. There's things that need to be redirected. There are things that need to be removed. There are things that need to be added on the wheel. So I'll cause you to hear my words. And I went down to Potter's house, and he was making something at the wheel. And, uh, and, and the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Now, the potter's God, and you are the clay and he's working on us, and it's marred. So he made it again into another vessel. He remade you into something better. That's the purpose of the spinning. Don't you wish whenever your mother issued forth that you were just perfect in every way? Now, she probably thought that, you know. But it didn't take her long to figure out that wasn't so. You know? She knows... Every mother knows their children's strengths and weaknesses. And if you've had multiple births, you know there's not two of them alike. There might be similarities, but there are differences. There just are. And so, and, and so, and so he made it again another vessel, and it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter? Can God not do for you? church of the living God as the potter does for the vessel so you are in my hand says the Lord the instant I spake concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to plug it up and to destroy it you see sometimes God has to destroy some things in our lives listen don't ever kick anybody if they're on hard times don't kick them they're on the wheel you say, oh, my goodness, they're going to have to file bankruptcy. They're on the wheel. I mean, let me, let me, let me tell you something. I, I don't wish bankruptcy on anybody. But you know where we got bankruptcy? From the Word of God. That's where it comes from. Do you understand? That's where it comes from. But we're on the wheel. Now, don't run out and bankrupt yourself. Don't be foolish and, and get, debt, get over head over heels in debt and say, well, it's okay. Listen, God expects us to be a wise steward. Wherever you are right now, you understand me? Wherever you are right now. But, he, but, but, but he's got us on the wheel. If a nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning the nation, concerning the kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, that he does not obey my voice and relent, you know, and of course this is straight to Israel. But for you and I, God has us on the wheel. 
and it's marred. And so I'm just going to have to remake that. I'm just going to have to remake that. Yeah, I'm going to give him blue eyes instead of brown. That was a joke. And so, and he's making us because he's got a design and a plan. And he's making us that vessel because he has a legacy to pour in us. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? You see, marred in the hands of the potter. But he wants to reform us. You see, he's formed us, and he wants to reform us. You know, this, this year marks 500 years of the Protestant Reformation. 500 years. October the 31st. You know, in a lot of countries, that is uh, even, um, a day for evangelicals to celebrate. Of course, we made it into trick or treat, Halloween, which only happens in America, by the way. But the rest of the world acknowledges that as uh, Reformation Sunday or Reformation Day, October the 31st. And that's when, that's when that Catholic priest, we, we tend to forget that, that Catholic priest, Martin Luther, went to the Wittenberg church door. I know it starts with a W, but in German it's pronounced with a V. And he nailed him to the door, 95 things that he felt that the Roman Catholic Church need to address to reform itself. You see, he wanted to reform the church because they'd embraced so many things that were outside of Scripture and leading people into, into, into terrible, terrible bondages. And, of course, the Pope didn't like it, and he says, you know, I'm going to burn that old boy to stake, and the rest is history. Do you understand? And so, marred, he made it again. I want you to understand this. If you'll read, if we read in Genesis, the creation story, the first three days, God makes a form. The last three days before the rest day, he fills the form. Do you understand? First three days, he creates the form. And then the last three days, he fills the form. It's important for you to know that. That's the kingdom paradigm. That's from the Father. And that's why he has to put us on the wheel to build the form. And things will come up and, and things will, will be blasted at us. And we think, oh, no, something else is wrong. Look for God. Stop looking for yourself and look for God in it. There's purpose in it. His, the, the stretching is there. He, the, uh, it's uncomfortable at times. And you feel overwhelmed, but trust him. Keep your eyes on him. It's a kingdom paradigm. It's the Father's way of making the form. You're the form. And he wants to fill you with his legacy. He wants to fill you with his, his uh, spiritual truth. He wants to fill you with things. He wants to make you and prepare you to become the next thing. Bethel. The house of God. You, you know, uh, somewhere along the line... We think this here is the church. This is just a temple, a tabernacle. Th that's all this is. This is a church house. The church is sitting in the seats. You're the church. You are the, uh, in, um, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I forget it, it's the first or second letter, but it's chapter 3 and I think it's verse 16. He says, know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? I'm a temple. I, that's what makes me, and when I get saved and the Spirit of God comes in and, and regenerates my dead spirit and makes me alive again, I'm born again. I'm in the body of Christ. And a body is, comes together and each part supplies. You see, we all have something to supply. We all need, listen, every part of your body needs blood. You see, it needs oxygen it, to make everything, you know, I just, it just, well, it's amazing. 
you know. Thank you, Lord. And, and your hearts are booming and your lungs are working and, and, and it's just, and you know, and you put food in and, and it's supposed to burn it all up, for, but my metabolism is very efficient. And, and so uh, uh, you people have an inefficient uh, metabolism. You're just skinny. And so, and so, and so, and so here we are. We, we are the, the temple of God. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it's all about his presence. It's all about realizing that God is here and that God lives in me. I'm saved. God lives in me. I, I no longer have a right just to say, you know, I'm just going to do what I want to. Well, go right ahead. Heartache city, here it comes. Failure and disappointment and, uh, you know, I mean, just let her rip. We'll see how, how shallow you are at the judgment seat of Christ when the rewards are handed out, the crowns. Thank God salvation's not a reward, it's a gift. But I want to have something in my crown to throw at the feet of Jesus. How about you? And so, and so, we don't honor our preference, but his presence. You know, I've, I've, I, for years I've heard people say, well, I like this kind of music, and I like that kind of music, and, and I like this style of worship, and I like that style of worship, and I wish we'd go back to the red book and the pews, and, 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 all, you know, and, and I said this Wednesday night, and I want to say it again. You don't know what you like. You just like what you know. That, isn't that natural? Oh, I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Yeah. But can I tell you that God's bigger than you are? And there's a whole lot more of God than there is of you. And there's things he wants to show you and do through you and with you and for you that you've never, ever even dreamed of or experienced. But you're never going to see it until you allow him to do his work on the wheel and you come to the realization that I am the house of God, that I'm a part of the body of Christ, that I am, and, and I'm connected, you see. That's why, that's why we, here, let's see, how can I, uh, see here. Um, I grew up in an era where, you know, well, now, you need to get saved, you need to get baptized, you need to join church, the local congregation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But somewhere along the line, we think that's more important than being connected to the body of Christ. You see, that's why if something don't go to suit me, I'm going to take my letter and join somewhere else. Well, you're just changing churches. But if you're in the body of Christ and you say, I'm going to cut myself off, you cut yourself off to the blood supply. You see the difference? You see, when you see that God has put you together in a place of spiritual alignment and to come together as a body and it's for him it's not what i like i want to think i feel it's for him and i'm to experience his presence and to experience his purpose and say oh god fill me fill me and show me all that you have for me because i'm too weak and too dumb to figure it out on my own and i hate to tell you you are too and he says, you see, finding your way home even in the midst of spinning is our focus and our purpose. Yeah, she don't do like I like. He don't do like I like. My goodness, I wish this, I wish that. You know, he's too skinny, she's too fat. You know, and all that nonsense. Do you understand? And realizing that I belong to God, and if you belong to God... We're connected. We're connected. Friends, it's not about gifting. You know, you might have all, you might operate in all the spiritual gifts. It, it's not about education. You might, you know, you might have so many degrees, you, they, your middle name's Fahrenheit. <laughs> you know, but it's not about education. It's not about gifting. 
It's not about anything you can think of. How much you have. You know, some people have their identity in, well, I've been successful. You know, here I, you know. I mean, I, well, here, you want to you wanna see my portfolio? And that's their measurement. And God doesn't use that measurement. I mean, listen, don't misunderstand me. I want God to bless you. I want, he to, I want him to bless you at, to the point where you realize that the blessings he sends your ways to advance the kingdom of God. To be a blessing to your family and to advance the kingdom of God. That's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, finding your way home even in the midst of spinning. It's not gifting, education, or anything else. It's nearness to him. I'm telling you, when, you, when you're near to him... And you can feel his presence and you can sense his presence. There's nothing else like it. And the problem is, we think it's all about seasons. You know, well, I'm in springtime. Oh, God's real. Summer. Oh, man, things are ripping out. And then comes fall and it's starting to cool off. And then it's winter and we're all shivering in the corner wondering where God went. Can I tell you that that's not how God wants to operate in our lives. The Bible says that there's trees in the heaven and they bear their manner of fruit every month. And it's for the healing of the nations. Now, do you think there are any nations in heaven that need healed? I don't think so. And of course, when it says nations, it means, it means Gentiles, people, ethnic groups, ethnos. You see, God wants us... To realize that we are the house of God and while we're in the spinning and things don't make sense sometimes and things break our hearts sometimes and people hurt us and let us down and disappoint us and all those things get looked past that to him and it's realize I'm the house of God and I'm going to be near to him. I want to be like him. And so as God pours down in me and I sense his nearness and his presence, it makes everything else dim. And it brings everything else in perspective to his greatness and that smallness. You see, I've got to walk in that and realize that's who I am. And if I'm going to pass on to Luke a vibrant, strong, determined, dedicated faith, he's got to see it in me. And he knows it's real. When we pray together, he's got to know that it's just not rote repetition. I'm not a robot, and he's not a robot, but it's real. Because it's not just, not just me and him, it's me, him, and Almighty God. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Holy cow. Mm -hmm. You see, don't be a cheap imitation of another that's being used of God. You can't be Bob Vineyard. You can't be Don Caps. Do, do you understand? You, you can't be uh, 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 Jeff... Keen or Gary Burroughs or Chris Sakai. You can't be, you can't, all you can be is you. you I, all you can be is you. That's it. You know, Caitlin up here playing the guitar and singing. I thought, boy, what a beautiful voice. And of course, I said, I said in the back of my, in, in, in the dark corner of my heart, I said, boy, I wish I could sing like that. I mean, I can't be her. <laughs> My goodness, she could have broke crystal. She tried. But it was a blessing. It didn't hurt. It wasn't fingernails on the chalkboard. You know what I'm saying? It was melodious. You know? And maybe you've got, you know, maybe some of you gals out there, you can do that. And you think, ah. and, and instead of, the devil wants us to be envious and jealous and fault fine and tear down and smear and malign. But God wants us to glorify him and say, Thank you for being used of the Lord. Do you get it? Do you get it? You see, don't be a cheap imitation of another that's being used to God. Thank God for who all's being used to God. Amen? 
but draw close and be submitted to him. Abraham, in, in Genesis 24. Oh, help me, Jesus. Abraham, in Genesis 24. He was called Abram. Say Abram. He says to Eliezer, his, his number one servant, who's a picture of the Holy Spirit, he said to Eliezer, he says, Now I want you to go back from where I come from, among my people, and I want you to find a wife for Isaac. And he says, well, what, what if they won't come? Should I come and bring him and take him up there and, 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 and show him off? So the girls will say, oh, yeah. No, he said, no. God will direct you. God will lead you, and you'll know who it's supposed to be. Boy, that's encouragement for everybody in here single and wants to be married. And said, uh, he says, now I want you to know you don't, you, don't bring, you don't take him up there. Now, God sent Abram to Canaan, a heathen pagan place. Abram was to be a testimony in Canaan. Those people were mean, ugly, nasty. I knew who they voted for in November. They were bad. They were not nice people. I, they were not nice people. They were pagan and ungodly. And he says, these, the, these people aren't fit to be a wife to my son and to be the mother of Israel. And so he went back, and of course he found, uh, uh, he found somebody, Sarah, Rachel. Rachel, yeah, he found Rachel. And uh, he brings her and the rest of history. You see, God knows, God has it all under control. But if we don't allow the spinning to take place and things be removed and things added, and we come to a place where we realize God's got this and I'm the house of God, I represent him, he lives in me, I'm connected to him, my supply is from him, I, my dependence is upon him, and no matter what happens and no matter where I go and no matter what he leads me to do, I'm, not, I'm just going to simply trust him and we're going. Hey, Abram, I want you to leave. And after you leave and when you get there, I'll tell you you're there. Boy, that doesn't sound like fun, does it? Most Christians will never get off the spinning wheel because things, oh, oh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know. I mean, I, I'm thank goodness Christy's not like it. Oh, I want, I want my mommy. I want to go back to mommy. She's not like that. She's followed me all over heaven and a half acre. That's what they call West Virginia back home. And so, you see, now it's time. I'm, I'm, oh, I've got to hurry. That going. I've got to hurry. Okay. All right. Let's go to Jericho. It means moon. That's what, that's what it means. Moon. Now, can I tell you something about a moon? A moon has no light of its own. It doesn't. All a moon does is reflect the light. And so the moon has to be aligned right to get the light from the sun and to reflect so the world can see it. And when they see the moon, they're seeing the sun. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? That's the purpose of the spinning. That's the purpose of preparing you. You're the house of God. And you're to be a reflector. You, you, alignment is essential. Don't stop at Gilgal. Don't stop. Don't stop at Jericho. Keep pressing in. You are Bethel. You're the house of God. And you operate that way as spirit-filled. You operate that way for the glory of the Lord. You know what happens when, when you come to that realization? Self-promotion will die. 
What's the use to brag about anything except him? Yeah. Self-promotion will die and dissipate. One thing you need to be ambitious for, and everything else will fall into place, and that's his glory. Be ambitious for him. Be ambitious for him. You say, well, I... I'm really good at this, you know, this business or that business or this or that. That's fine. Be good, but know where it comes from and represent him well along the way. Amen? I'm trying to hurry. You see, remember when Jesus was down in Jordan and John the Baptist was baptizing and Jesus came and he submitted to baptism, and, G and John looked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Now, they're out in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness when this is happening. And the Bible says that when he baptized Jesus, the Father says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. This, this is, you see, in the wilderness. And what did Jesus do after that? He went out in the further in the wilderness for 40 days. Amen? He went on out there. And then the Bible says he come to Jordan. Honest, I'm going to quit. Which means the descender. The one that what is to be his reflection, the one that is to be his reflection is the one who's willing to go down again. Now, what do you mean by that? Psalm, did I give you Psalm 3723? Psalm 3723. Okay. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and delights in his way. Now, can I show you something? I'm walking over here in the dark, guys. You see these set of steps? You know when your steps have to be ordered? It's when you're going down, not when you're coming up. You see, you've got to watch to make sure. Going up is a piece of cake. You don't even have to look. Well, you shouldn't have to. But going down, regardless, has to be ordered. And it's ordered by the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so there are times that God wants you to descend. He wants you to descend. He wants you to say, okay, Lord, spin me again. Spin me again. Come home again. Reflect again. Descend again. You know, in all four Gospels, the Bible talks about the baptism of Jesus. That John baptized him in the River Jordan. Only the Gospel of John says that the... Uh, well, they all say he was baptized and the Spirit descended. But only the Gospel of John says that the Spirit of the Lord ascend, descended and, ab and abode on him. Now, my question to you is this. If you had to walk around with a dove on your shoulder and you wanted to keep it there, you'd think about everything you're doing. Wouldn't you? Everything you're engaging in. Everything. Because you wanted the dove to stay right there. See, Jesus was the first man that the Spirit of God ever lit upon and stayed. Whew. My God. I tell you, I had to bawl and weep and repent a number of times last night. And I pray you do too, that you will want to. You see, what or how would we live with a dove on your shoulder and you didn't want to fly away? Did I give you Psalm chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3? Put it up there. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, sits in the paths of sinners, or, see, or sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law on it he meditates how often? Fifteen minutes on Monday morning. And, and, and look here, verse 3. This is what I want to get at. 
He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Lord, spin me again. Remake me again. Fill me again. Help me to be a reflector again. Lord, I want to experience your presence. I want it to be real. Now, a lot of times, if we're in this seasonal thing, you know, oh, Lord, send showers of blessings. Doesn't say nothing about showers there. He says, it's planted by the river. You, don't, you know, it can never rain if you're planted by the river. That's where most of your water comes from anyway. If you're a tree. Do you hear what I'm saying? Planted by the river. Listen, there's a river that flows out of the throne of God. I'm planted by that river. I'm in Christ. I'm in Him. I'm in, the Holy Spirit is in me. I'm in Christ. Christ in the Father. Hallelujah. I'm happy. I'm safe. And I'm right there, and I choose. I choose. I, it's all about His presence. It's all about His presence. Bless His holy name. Do you remember Ruth and Naomi? I'm trying to quit, but it's just too good. Remember Ruth and Naomi in the book of Ruth? You know, uh, Naomi had left Bethlehem, Judah, she and her husband, and their two sons, and he went into Moab. And, uh, and, the, and their sons married two, two uh, Moabite women, and they come out, and, and, and the two sons die. The husband dies, and the two sons die. And Naomi says, I'm going to go back home. And uh, um, Oprah... Or, Orpha, do you know Oprah's name was supposed to be been Orpha, but they didn't know how to spell it? Just thought I'd pass that along. Um, I know, it's just nonsense, isn't it? And so Orpa, Orpa, right? Orpa, O-R-P-A-H, right? I don't care. O, the big O. They said, <laughs> Naomi said, you go back with your people. And she said, all right. See ya. I don't want to be ya. But Ruth says, listen, I'm going to stay with you. And your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I'm going with you. And they went back. And, of course, she's gleaning in the field. And Boaz, a kinsman redeemer, you know, she's, she's gathering in the corners. You see, that's welfare. You leave something for them to work to get. You don't grab it all up for yourself. And, and Boaz sees her and lays eyes on her and says, you know, I'm going to let her be owner of this place. I'm going to marry her. You understand? That's what happened. And you got to understand, under the Mosaic Law, they had crop rotations. Now, Boaz and, and Ruth had Obed. Obed had Jesse. Jesse had David. And here David is out in the fields with his sheep. And here comes Samuel. Guess what field David was probably in? The same one. I believe God's got a pattern and order. I believe he was probably in that same field where Boaz saw David's great-great-grandma. Isn't God good? Let's move it ahead a little bit longer, a little bit faster. The Bible says that there were shepherds tending their fields at night. And a host of angels shone upon him, singing, having a hallelujah hoedown. And he says, up here in town, the Messiah has been born. I believe it was the same field. You see, God's a God of pattern. Man, I'm getting glory bumps all over me. God wants to spin us. Don't be afraid of the spinning. If you get off there... You just at best you're just going to be a carnal, on again, off again, in and out, up and down individual. At best, let the spinning, let God have His work, and through it all, know that you are the house of God, and His Spirit is in you, and you're focused on Him, and you're sensing His presence, whether you're spinning or if you're off the wheel, and you're a vessel of honor. Knowing that you are to reflect the true and living God 
And there'll come a time when you need to descend again and get on the spinning wheel again. God knows best for you. He knows better than you know. Do you hear what I'm saying? You say, oh, I know that person. They've messed up so many times. Listen, God ain't finished spinning. Hallelujah. All I got to do is look at me. And he's spinning. The easy thing is, you, you see, whatever you do in the house of God, if it becomes a burden, if it becomes tiresome, you're not doing it for him. You're doing it for you. Do what you need to do as unto him. Do you hear me today? You don't do it. It's not about me. It's about my Lord. Noah, I'm trying to quit. You remember Noah? He, he was the first vineyard to ever live on the earth. Noah Vineyard. Yeah. What did he do? Well, now I know some people say, no, he was, he was a farmer, so his last name was Farmer. I like thinking his last name was Vineyard. That's a joke, too. When the ark landed and everybody went their ways, and the Bible says he farmed and he planted a vineyard. We've been around ever since. And the Bible says that he made some wine from them grapes. And he got drunk. Now, I don't know. He might have been from Kentucky or Tennessee. I don't know where he's from. That's a joke, too. And, uh, and you can find it in, in Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 to 24. And the Bible says while he was drunk and he was laying naked on the bed or the cot or whatever he was on. And the Bible says, uh, yeah, there it is. So, so Shem and Japheth took, took a garment and laid it on both their shoulders, and they backed in. They wouldn't look up on their dad's nakedness. They backed in, and they covered the nakedness of their father with their, with their faces turned away. They did not want to see their father's nakedness. Now, that's pretty obvious what we're talking about, and I'm not going to belabor the point. Okay? Move on. So, and now look here. Noah awoke from his wine and knew. Now, now look here. And knew. He just woke up and he knew what his younger son had done to him. Now, um, the implication here is some type of homosexual encounter. Okay? Because the Bible says when Ham, you go back in the verse, uh, back in that chapter, when Ham saw him, the word saw there means to desire, to lust after. See, that, that, that evil spirit's been around a long time. And so, and so Noah, and, and, what, and so, so when, 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 the, when, he, when he woke up, when Noah woke up and he saw what had happened, what did he do? He said, cursed be Canaan. Well, Canaan, no, Ham's son didn't do anything. It was Ham. But he said, cursed be Canaan, and you shall serve your uncle's descendants. And, and you will, it, 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 there was a curse placed on him. Canaan. Not Ham, but Canaan. Can I tell every mom and dad here that everything you do has a, has a ripple effect? Everything you say, everything you do, I'm trying to quit. Help me, Jesus. Curse be Canaan. First generation's compromise will be the next generation's captivity. Write that down. You see, Canaan was a land. It was a people. It was a family. And it was a person. And God sent Abram where? To Canaan. You see, God is a redeeming God. God is a God after, I, you say, oh, I tell you, I'm just so sick of these perverts. Well, God's not. God loves them. He hates their sin, but he loves them. And he will redeem them. Don't throw them out. God wants to save them. 
He wants, and so he sent Abram to Canaan to restore and change those people. Matter of fact, to just reinforce what God's doing, that he's not going to throw away Ham and all his descendants, God changed Abram's name to Abra what? Oh, isn't that something? Abraham. And so, and so the sons of the prophets... Religion said, well, we need to go look for Elijah. Uh, and he says, no. You see, religion wants to always hold on to what they know. But the, people, the men of the city said, ah, Elisha, come over here and help us with something that Elijah never helped us with. We got bad water. And the Bible says uh, in, in Joshua 6, 24, and honest, this is the last one. But they burned the city. Remember when the children of Israel... Uh, when it marched around se uh, six times, and on the, on the seventh day they marched around seven times, and the walls came down, and they conquered the, the people of, of, of Jericho when Israel was coming out of e Egyptian bondage. They burned the city and all that was with fire, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put in the treasure of the house of the Lord. You see, it was all, and it was cursed. And the Bible says, but Elisha was called to reverse the curse of Jericho, and he did. Abraham was released to redeem Canaan, but he, but he couldn't do that until he had to let Lot leave. Can I tell you, some of you need to let Lot leave. You need to let Lot go and embrace what God wants you to embrace. Let Lot go. Well, bless God. Stop, don't coddle a lot, but raise up Elisha's in your life. Learn to honor. Honor is the currency of heaven. Honor what God honors, and you'll pass on a legacy. If all you can do is have a sharp mouth, sharp tongue, critical tongue, Always tearing down, always finding fault, that's what you're going to pass on. Because you see, your children are going to reflect you. Do you hear me? Let's stand our feet.